Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This presentation should run about 30 to 35 minutes. I'll be using some video embedded components, so if you have any problems seeing my screen, please don't hesitate to report them in the sidebar. So today's webinar will be focusing on uniqueness, advocacy, and affinity. These are the three principles behind our panel website, Point Club. My name is Joshua Bresner, and I'm Director of Member Experience here at Innovate MR. For those of you who don't know, Innovate MR is a global online sampling technology firm generating high-quality data from engaged panelists. We are also the folks behind PointClub.com, one of the fastest-growing panel websites in the space. Today's presentation will be broken out into two pieces. Uh, first, I'll be really diving into the state of the panel world currently, discussing some things that plague the panel space, uh, strain points, and considerations. And then I'll be diving into some key differentiators that Innovate MR is doing to help set the pace and alleviate some of these concerns, uh, you know, both previously through our existing Point Club website and the launch over the summer of our new revamped Point Club 3.0. To begin, I'll be highlighting the importance of panel uniqueness and member advocacy, how they influence that nebulous but incredibly critical AllSpark known as member affinity. And I'll be discussing the challenges in delivering a super-powered panel experience. So part one, challenges, game changers, and the state of the union. So as we dive in, I think we first really need to set the table to understand why this conversation is so important. Vigilance around member affinity and member advocacy may seem like bedrock principles for a panel company um, or, or any business, really. Uh, but in practice, at least, the current landscape is really unfortunate for users. Uh, too often, panel is viewed as synonymous with disposable. They're seen purely as a stream, they're a commodity, um, and they're basically conditioned as such from the moment they sign up. And sure, there, there's lots of talk around influence and sharing your valuable opinions all over the call to actions, uh, but really it kind of ends there across most panel sites. Once uh, registration is complete, they're kind of left on their own. And the deck is really stacked against panelists. Once they sign up, they're left to deal with a lot. Uh, forgettable experience, unclear expectations, there's no real motivation for any excellence, and uh, just a general lack of care. The typical experience is heavy on the transactional, but forgettable with unclear guidelines or motivation to excel. Uh, there's little in the way of cultivation or TLC in the average, and that really impacts who is signing up and how they perform. No shit. Not to mention a dozen other issues that ultimately make the panel experience a turnoff for most people. And that sense of disposability uh, that panelists feel, it's systemic from usually being focused on the immediate uh, with a short-term approach toward panel that ultimately ends up costing companies more in the long run. Uh, the real churn and burn, low incidence, wide net studies, uh, practices that just strain your panel, um, burn them out, and, and basically make them a trit a lot faster than they should. Um, you know, in the past, I've been privy to emergency conversations about attrition rates and recruitment spend. You know, these all hands on deck kind of stop the bleed conversations. Uh, I'm always surprised that there's not really a correlation to the skimpier panelist practices that are simultaneously being pushed. Uh, it's either ignored or shrugged off. Uh, you know, lower payout, <laughs> you know, longer surveys um, without much benefit to the user um, is, is obviously going to have a real impact on your bottom line. And, you know, I think this conversation is especially timely. The industry is currently shifting. Right now, traditional market research captures a lot of the market share. Um, but as additional methodologies become more and more commonplace, market research is going to be competing more than ever for eyeballs and eyeballs that are going to stick around. Uh, there's, there just is a shrinking respondent pool, and it will continue to shrink over the coming couple of years. Survey inventory helps, but you know, to differentiate in 2019 and beyond, a panel needs to resonate beyond just the tried and true. The tried and true is not working. Uh, there's, there's tremendous fatigue in panel websites, and more and more companies have been just shrugging them off. Uh, in order to differentiate, you need resonance, and that resonance is the member experience. It's member advocacy. Uh, it raises the question, why? Why does member advocacy matter so much? Uh, why are we here today? Well, let's look into that. So data quality and bad practices, two ends of a spectrum that are talked about daily. Uh, member advocacy greatly reduces the likelihood of conditioned bad behaviors, which means better, stronger data quality overall. And when I say bad behaviors, I'm talking about actions that come from good members who wouldn't fraud a fly, uh, but find themselves at the end of their rope in your panel. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Speeding, straight lining, even falsification of profiling and pre-screening data are often not intentionally malicious. 
Our member satisfaction surveys tell us that these behaviors are the last gasp uh, from a member who feels that their time is being wasted. By reducing and offsetting panel pain points whenever possible, we can count on fewer struggling users overall. overall. And that, that's, that creates significantly less desperation behavior, which is the majority of what we call fraud currently. Uh, desperation behavior. Why can't I convert? Why can't I get it complete? Why can't I get into these studies? Uh, very real questions that are asked by panelists every day um, and should be acknowledged. All right, so I want you to imagine that we're all standing in a room right now, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Um, how many people in the MR space would sign up and actively participate in your average panel website during your free time? Anyone? Anyone? Past the... Anyone? Anyone? Uh, you know, I, I, I can't see you, but I'm guessing the number is pretty small, and it's, it's for good reason. Uh, instinctually, we all know that participating in the run-of-the-mill panel is typically just more trouble than it's worth. Many panels have stacked the deck so heavily against the respondent that through sheer attrition, only one cross-section really remains. You know, in spite of the lower conversion rates, the lower earnings, the endless grid questions, and the overall bad experience. And that's who I like to call the professional survey takers. It, it's, it's tough because, you know, they, they're active. They, they help fill uh, projects. They help respond. And, you know, they... they not, they're not necessarily dishonest. It's just they have a tendency to overendorse. They have a tendency to say what they think the study wants them to say. Um, and in large numbers and unchecked, they can skew your studies. Um, you know, the, it's just a fact of the industry right now that uh, some of these professional survey takers are on every site in the sun. They, they know the MR space better than some employees. They know what uh, projects are looking for. Um, you know, and, and they have to be they have to be accounted for. They have to be uh, watched. <laughs> at, at Innovate, we understand that the quality audiences we need, whether it's representational gen pop, B2B, business professionals, medical influencers, uh, they're not going to tolerate a negative experience. Advocacy aims to correct the industry oversaturation of professional survey takers by diversifying our recruitment streams and ensuring a user experience that isn't tantamount to table scraps. Uh, you know, we, we know that the professional survey taker is going to sit and grind. Uh, and, and that's okay <laughs> sometimes. Um, but to get the segments we need with the representation we need, you know, we have to do better. Uh, we have to. Um, some additional metrics directly related to advocacy include less recruitment spend, greater retention and tenure, increased clicks, completes, and higher satisfaction word of mouth. Virability is a huge factor. Uh, this is also represented in industry scoring, whether you're looking at the Better Business Bureau, Facebook, um, what's the reputation? Uh, metrics that are very important is to look at the overall sentiment and scorecard of your brand, as well as obviously where the strain points are. Knowing what the, your users are complaining about is really first and foremost. And, you know, having a member, member uh, support team that is, you know, really attuned and, and working very closely with the rest of the, the company is, is crucial. Uh, I want you to think of advocacy as a miracle glue. You know, it, it plugs any would-be holes in your ship. Uh, but it protects both the paid resources that you've invested in, uh, all this acquisition and recruitment spend, and it, it also uh, makes sure that you know the organic recruit, uh, resources that your marketing and social media teams have spent so much on uh, to cultivate are going to stick around. Um, you know, it's 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 making sure that you have users that are going to stay the course and stay with you long over the average. When Matt, George, and Greg first sat down to conceptualize what Innovate's flagship panel website should be, they knew that nailing the look and feel, tone, and the general vibe of the site was vital. Point Club was branded and designed specifically around grooming user affinity as driven by three key tenets, uh, differentiate for success, offset the mundane, and frame for engagement. So you ask any web designer and they'll tell you it takes at least 50 milliseconds for a user to form an opinion about your website and determine whether they're going to stick around. In terms of driving affinity and capturing the attention of potential audiences, Point Club is framed in the world of Captain PC for a few reasons. 
Well, yes, superheroes are big business, and they definitely allow for a color palette and a style that pops. Uh, we also like the symbolism that new users pick up on. From childhood on, we see superheroes and we immediately think of champions of the people, defenders of truth and justice, um, and defenders of the little guy. Um, as far as symbolic associations go, it just made sense, um, particularly with some of the developments within our own industry over the past couple years. Offsetting the mundane. So equally important for us was uh, establishing a tone to help offset monotony. No offense attended, but the traditional panel experience can be a bit dry uh, and difficult. Depending on client survey inventory, conversion isn't always easy. Uh, we wanted something to help keep members engaged and invested, particularly when they're struggling. Uh, for us, designing Captain PC as this affable, pop culture-loving smartass makes sense. Uh, it supplied an air of playfulness without compromising the integrity of the surveys themselves. And it provides a necessary palate cleanser between surveys. You know, even on the heels of a 30-minute study about tax form etiquette, a dash of levity does do wonders and, and go a long way in inspiring additional clicks. And that brings me to my favorite aspect of Point Club, which is framing for engagement. Um, a couple years ago, Gray Smith, the uh, SVP of product design, and I sat down and we drafted what was a 50-page document outlining the in-world narrative of Point Club. It covered our character roles, backstory, vernacular, the tone, um, and provided a clear vision for all of our upcoming promotions, contests, and site developments. We, we really wanted to, to structure a world where characters had very specific reasons to exist. Um, you know, including our heroes, where, where you have the cheerleader archetype, you have the taskmaster, you have the character who is very involved in member data uh, and showcasing member data, as well as villains, which we utilize to showcase bad behavior in some of our grooming efforts. Uh, you know, we've turned traits such as straight lining, speeding, uh, falsifying into villains, and we run regular promotions against our panel to really kind of showcase and get members invested in why their data matters, why it's important that they be honest, and to help right the wrongs midstream. Because as I mentioned before, you know, um, most people who, we, who accrue flags in a panel, it's coming from a place of strain. It's not coming from being a malicious agent in your, in your site trying to, to make trouble. They, they, they want to have a good experience, and conversion can be a challenge. And these villains, uh, villain characters, really help us, uh, you know, put that into a broader uh, context for them and, and take all these kind of value props on survey sites, these rules, and make it relevant again. Um, this narrative, you know, it really is world building for the brand. It's the key to creating a wholly unique, unique take on a familiar formula, and that's the panel website. Um, it, it needs to engage on an entirely different level uh, in, in 2019 to attract, to retain, and satisfy the type of high-quality respondents we want and that our, our clients require. And, you know, tying this back to sourcing, a lot of panel websites go after the professional survey takers, uh, the, the group we talked about earlier. Uh, they court them um, and they, they fill their numbers with them. Um, you know, at, at Innovate with Point Club, uh, our flavor, this, uh, this neat coat of paint, <laughs> as it were, uh, isn't just cosmetic. Um, it, it helps bridge audiences that traditional panel sites simply can't deliver. Uh, you know, for every respondent who seeks a transactional experience, there are those who, uh, you know, looking to the traffic of sites like Reddit and BuzzFeed and the like, you know, who just engage based on their gut. Uh, they, they engage based on the TLC and, and the warm and fuzzies. Uh, these are real things. And, and I, I'm always amazed when I hear these things dismissed uh, as not revenue generating, as not tying into the bottom line. Um, I think that they're the key difference makers <laughs> to to being an average brand that no one pays attention to and, you know, being somebody that is considered top of the class. So I, I talk about affinity a lot, and it's probably important that I touch on it here. Um, looking at any panel as a purely transactional enterprise with users, member satisfaction typically boils down the metrics around survey value. Uh, available inventory, the ease of hitting the cash out threshold, and ultimately money in pocket. Member affinity is much trickier. Uh, it's sentiment based, but it impacts a host of metrics. It's how people respond to and interact with the panel, so it's measurable against activity. It's also the likelihood that member will con members will uh, continue visiting your panel, so it's equally a barometer of retention and attrition. Uh, but affinity above everything else is goodwill. 
It determines how much slack a member will cut you for any unfortunate hiccups and will, and how strongly they're going to advocate for your panel without prompt or reward. I think of it like this. When I go shopping, there's a reason I go to Target and not generic store number one or, say, generic store number two. And it isn't prices. Otherwise, I'd be at Walmart. No, I'm shopping at Target out of affinity. And that's the magical part to me, um, where affinity really becomes a true difference maker. While it can definitely be impacted by the transactional, and it is. I mean, members want to get paid. <laughs> they, they, they don't want to do something for nothing. But uh, affinity grooms a user base that transcends these kind of dollars and cents and the transactional and, and really ensures that the people that are there feel a connection Um, because a connection directly ties to metrics like your quality, uh, your quality control, uh, how contextual and how deep your open-end data goes. Um, You know, when it it comes to research, uh, you know, a brand is is not enough. You need need to have, you need to have some kind of connection. Uh, You need to have something tangible for, for users to hold on to and to feel something about. It's it's not just it's not just butterflies in the tummy. Which brings us to the magic ingredient, advocacy. Uh, uniqueness of panel is a wonderful way to catch people's eyes, but without advocacy, all the uniqueness in the world won't generate affinity. Uh, no matter how we refer to them, advocacy means ensuring that our users are represented across all aspects of the panel experience. On the member-facing side, advocacy means articulating the promise, delivering on the promise, being transparent when something goes wrong, and ensuring acknowledgement, concessions, and or condolences, respectively. Articulating the promise, which is establishing the rules of the relationship, uh, is key to setting up members for success. From recruitment through onboarding and into each survey invite thereafter, a user should always know why they are there, what is expected of them, and what they will gain from the experience. Delivery on the promise means fulfilling our end of the relationship. Whether it's getting members cashed out in the time frame as promised uh, or, articul- or articulating to a user why their data was invalidated by a client, uh, efficient follow through from the panel is essential. And I mean bare minimum. Like this type of advocacy isn't even affinity building so much as just not being shady. <laughs> And I want to, again, bring up the call to actions throughout the MR space. You know, your opinions are important to us. Share your valuable thoughts. Be heard. These appeals are great recruitment buzzwords. But if a member's voice is truly important and you want them to know it, the message has to be holistic, uh, both in the client survey as well as in your customer support inbox. Uh, Acknowledgement of the panelists, their concessions, such as offering a small reward of points when a survey has failed, as we do in Point Club, uh, or condolences mean everything. Uh, it, it, it's what eclipses a purely transactional experience and cultivates that uh, user a- affinity through member-facing advocacy. The, the, the knowledge that we're looking after them, uh, that we're tending to our garden. And, and, you know, in terms of cultivating panel, you know, it's, it's really important that members are seen as a resor- resource to be nurtured um, and, and listened to. And there's another side of advocacy which members might not see, but they definitely feel. Um, as it directly impacts and influences their every experience on, the, on in the panel. Uh, and that's behind the scenes advocacy. Um, at Innovate, that, this means ensuring that member experience is represented from the onset of all initiatives via best practices uh, and SOPs. We do this to ensure retention and overall site satisfaction and to avoid situations with, which put any undue strain on panel health and quality. Um, obviously, there's going to occasionally be jobs and projects where you, you can just anticipate greater strain uh, whether it's your, uh, you know, diary study or, or it's something that has a really, really low incidence. And, and in, in, you know, making sure that there's concessions to offset that strain is important. On, on the bid management side, it's really about the types of jobs we're taking on. You know, is it a good fit? Um, how is it utilizing targeting to make sure that we're not burning a lot of our panel? Um, is it going to alienate our base? You know, is there, you know, is it potentially sketchy or abusive or, uh, you know, is the subject matter something where we need to put some safeguards in place to make sure that, you know, no one is offended? Um, we also want to look out for excessive grid questions, uh, making sure that projects are, you know, mobile, uh, optimized whenever possible, um, and ensuring that the LOI and the incentive is fair, uh, you know, whether it's a consumer study or a B2B study or a healthcare study, you know, you have to make sure that the amount of time, the audience, and, and what you're paying them uh, for their time uh, are not just fair, but, you know, 
offer a value that's, uh, that's worth the user's time. And on the client services and project management side, we look closely at several aspects. You know, conversion. Uh, conversion is the temperature of panel satisfaction, not to mention the gauge of how much recruitment spend is being wasted. Uh, you know, targeting and avoiding panel burn is, is key. Uh, you know, obviously someone says that they're a Tesla owner. Let's get them to study first and foremost before we do any kind of pre-screening. Um, you know, this is this is just basic etiquette to make sure that, you know, you're not you're not seeing too much uh, fatigue on the panel, too many surveys that they just can't get into in a row. We're also looking at scrub rates from clients. We're, make, we're seeing where things are overly aggressive. Um, and, you know, we're offering survey design best practices wherever possible. Um, you know, when technical support issues, making sure that if there's any component of downloading an app, for example, in a survey, uh, just making sure that the, the experience is, is clean and, and that if a member uh, sees anything, because, you know, they are our eyes and our ears, sometimes past traditional QA, uh, making sure that, you know, we're acting on it quickly. So brands all over the world rely on market research companies to inform their decisions. You would assume then that market research companies utilize market research against their own in-house panels more than anyone. Uh, For whatever reason you'd be wrong, it's really not a common practice. Um, At Innovate, we run everything by our Point Club panel to ensure member advocacy in its purest form. Whether it's to a blast of thousands or a smaller hand-selected focus group, our members are the first to see any potential campaigns, dashboard changes, or narrative rollouts we're considering, uh, as well as obviously pilots of unique uh, types of jobs. Um, And this is to sound off on what works and, and what doesn't so that we can kind of adjust accordingly. Member satisfaction surveys help us gut check relevance, find potential holes in our processes, monitor the temperature of panel sentiment, and yeah, it increases affinity. Uh, Through these MSATs, we also further drive that all-important sense of community and member collaboration while proving our eagerness, and again, not a willingness, our eagerness to listen and improve. Members aren't just rewarded for participation, they're often credited and thanked publicly. This reinforces that someone is actively listening and that they are valued across all aspects of the site. It also really brings them in as collaborators, um, you know, and they feel a real sense of pride when they see something go live on our site, a change, a development, a new character even, uh, that they had a direct hand in informing. And at Innovate, we want panelists who feel appreciated for their time and loyalty, so we've implemented various features and methodologies to help tip the scales in their favor. Contests, drawings, and promotions, uh, such as our Daily Sweeps campaign on social media and our Spotlight challenges, um, are great for providing additional opportunities for users. The key to these types of bonus activities is presence and follow-through, particularly on the back end. Announcing winners by name and tagging them on social media whenever possible helps ensure a presence of legitimacy and prompt good word of mouth. Many panel websites, particularly those who focus on a purely transactional relationship with users, they miss out on one of the biggest opportunities to groom affinity, and that's uh, establishing a relationship between members and their data. So why is closing the feedback loop so important? Well, firstly, it breaks up the cash is carrot attitude, uh, which often reduces surveys and a little more than necessary evils along the path to redemption. Uh, stakes in the game provide some context. They, they give members a sense of weight and ultimately more respect for the form. And, and even if that's only a cursory awareness, a member invested in their data is much less likely to develop these Machiavellian tendencies. As to closing the loop, it can be tough because client data obviously is not a panel site's to share. Uh, but by using results from in-house studies, whether fun quizzes, polls, member satisfaction surveys and the like, uh, member data can be showcased in creative, effective ways. And by touting the members involved directly, that promise of influence is reinforced. Uh, you're, you're bringing them in again, again as collaborators. You're bringing them in as having a stake in the game. Um, and their affinity and their respect for their data increases. All right, so, you know, I think we've pretty well covered kind of the state of the union um, of the panel world. We've also gotten into some specific uh, housekeeping items and, and just best practices that should really be adhered to to make sure that, you know, you are protecting that lifeblood of your of your research business, which is really your respondents, your members, your users, whatever you're calling them. Um, for this next part, I'd really like to focus on some differentiators. And, the, and these are uh, some high-level features, aspects, and business practices that uh, we here at uh, Innovate MR on the Point Club team have have really kind of 
put a lot of heart and a lot of love into to try to make the user experience the best it can be. Um, you know, not just in terms of engaging, but also in educating behavior. Um, so I'm going to show these off. Um, I'm just going to go through these one by one. And again, if you have any questions along the way, please, uh, please type them in the sidebar. All right, let's do this. And so number one, um, I know we've talked about it a lot, but I have to put in here as number one is really brand affinity. Um, again, the tone of the brand, the tone of Point Club. Um, we feel we have built this universe. We have delivered this universe that is consistent, not just in our social media, but in our quizzes, in our fun polls, and the ways we engage our panel covers over into the site itself. If you visit the Point Club website, our member guidebook in particular is a place where we've loaded in lots of lore, lots of backstory. Um, you know, we have our we have our superheroes origins. We have how this relates to the uh, narrative version of market research. You know, you are an aspiring superhero and you join Point Club to power up. And uh, along the way, you're sent on missions to solve distress calls. Uh, you know, and they might they might be from a, a school, they might be from a company, uh, they might be from the deep recesses of space. And the and the idea here is, of course, we really want you to kind of buy in to the narrative uh, and to the fun world that we're presenting. Um, and and the best part of this, with all these kind of ongoing features in our member guidebook and social media, it is an unraveling comic book. And 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 the value prop there is that members become a part of the action. You know, it's, it's one thing to slap a superhero skin on your termite truck and say, super termite busters. But I, that, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't go very deep. That's pretty surface. Uh, at Point Club, we really show our, our commitment to the TLC, to the extra touches uh, that resonates with users, uh, that has them engaging with us on the site and through social media. Um, you know, just just touting how much they enjoy the brand, how much they enjoy the tone. Um, you know, is is superhero theme going to work for all audiences? Absolutely not. But I think I think the key is the sincerity that's that's intact there. Another key differentiator is the daily streak. The daily streak is a loyalty component on the Point Club dashboard that we've had for a couple of years now and has seen tremendous. Uh, success with. Users earn bonuses on all surveys they take based on how many days consecutively they've come to the Point Club dashboard. Uh, level 1, 10% bonus on all surveys taken. Level 2, 20% bonus. Well, this goes all the way up to level 10, which means that a survey that's, let's say, worth $2 on our site, and it's worth $2 on all the competitor sites, uh, for a user that has shown max loyalty and, and cultivated a level 10, they're, they're, they're getting $4. They're getting double the value they would anywhere else. Um, and, and we have lots of members who actively pursue their streak level and, you know, really fight to keep it. Because, you know, once they hit level 10, it is not fixed. They, they still have to continue logging in or else the streak level does go back down. Um, you know, this kind of gamification ensures that, you know, we're, we're constantly making sure that members uh, are keeping Point Club top of mind and, and it's paid dividends for us. Uh, it's, it's just a tremendous feature. Fail rewards. So, you know, th there's a lot of pain as we've talked about. I've belabored that point pretty, pretty extensively here, but, uh, you know, not converting is, is rough. Uh, failing surveys is rough. Uh, in fact, it's it's the number one source of strain on, on panel is, is you know, there's just so many times you can have a bad experience and not get through on a study before you just throw your hands up and say, I'm done. Uh, fail rewards is our way of, of showing and acknowledging that we, that we feel the pain. Um, you know, we've we've seen it countless times that, you know, offering just a few points, uh, offering just an apology or a sincere uh, message at the end, you know, acknowledging the user strain goes a long way here. Um, you know, at, at its core, members want to feel like they're being heard. That's that's part of the research element. Um, so it's only fair that we kind of close the feedback loop. And when they don't get into a survey, we should be telling them. Uh, you know, sorry, that, that, that's unfortunate. Uh, here's some points. Here's a, here's a, you know, consolation for you. Um, you know, let's put you in something that's more relevant. Uh, I think it's important to always kind of 
be looking at it and, and making sure that you're not just dumping them back on their dashboard and hoping that they're going to rinse repeat uh, like a rat in a cage. They're just not going to do it. They're, they're not going to keep chugging away trying to uh, get the cheese. Uh, you know, a lot of sites have onboards. Um, we, we like to take it a little further than that. Um, and that's by actually taking our members through step by step and showing them what's expected of them um, and how to get the most benefit out of the site. Uh, you know, training members is, is something that we do at the onboard, but then we do throughout their tenure as well. Um, constantly checking in through using our characters and these kind of overlays. Uh, we have what we call our experiential dashboard, which we'll get into. Um, you know, this onboard is really important to just establish the tone and make sure that members are seeing the data they're sharing, that they're reviewing the data they're sharing when they register with us, uh, that they know what's expected. Um, you know, this is really a commitment to quality. It's, uh, it's, it's framing their entire tenure and, uh, you know, it's, it's also a fun experience. So the Point Club Onboard contains five qualitative questions and one open-end question for the purposes of member training and assessment. Uh, users are informed when they either pass or fail each of these checks with conditional messaging to help groom future expectations. You know, we're very transparent here uh, because we want our members to succeed. We want them to have success and we want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, if, if there's deeper fraud considerations, we're going to catch them. So, so the onus here is really on just making sure that anyone who onboards with us knows what's expected and we're kind of gauging passively in the background kind of what our overall trust in them is. So let's go through a series of steps here. Uh, the first would be a consistency check. And within the session, a data point is re-asked to ensure that their answers for both are a match. Uh, the second instance is as far, as far removed as possible. But the, the goal here is that if they say, for example, that they're a high school graduate, and then a minute later they say they're a college grad, they're not paying much of atten much attention, and we really want to uh, write that right away uh, to let them know that we're monitoring these things and that you know um, just not paying attention and flying through is is not going to behoove them at all on the panel. Um, the second would be a comprehension and speeding check. So a multifaceted question that requires a summation of the variables is asked. Uh, this is timed behind the scenes based on a, an average uh, in seconds to assess the respondent's comprehension while factoring it against their, their total uh, time spent calculating the answer. You know, obviously comprehension outweighs everything. So, you know, because there's going to be members that just read fast. Next up, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Next would be an over-endorsement check. Uh, and this is a multi-punch capturing, you know, in this case, video game consoles owned, um, just to figure out, you know, who, who is p potentially a, a game prosumer, somebody that is truly a game enthusiast versus somebody who just wants to select every possible answer so that they can get every possible survey uh, sent to them. Uh, there is a distinction, and over endorsement is very important to kind of help us gauge that, not just in terms of how many answers they give, but you know what their over endorsement behavior is like across all categories. If someone uh, over endorses strictly in the technology and video game fields, but does not over endorse in business or travel, you know, then they, in all likelihood, they're probably pretty honest with you. But if you're seeing over endorsement across various uh, data fields, you have a problem. So we just want to put it on the docket to them that you know this is being watched. Uh, and then comes a series of two different red herrings. Uh, so these trap questions, the first one being an attention check. Uh, this is a single select where the question phrasing is very specific. Uh, select option labeled B below, and then they select B. Um, you know, again, we have tons of these randomized through, but, you know, they see one of these just to see if they're paying attention. And mind you, the characters on the side are kind of looking at their overall cumulative behavior, meaning if they're missing every trap, we're getting kind of more and more stern with them. Whereas if, you know, they miss one here or there, we just remind them of what behavior we're looking for. Second would be false value endorsement. So this is a question seeking affinity or endorsement of brands, uh, you know, which of these products do you regularly use? Uh, which of these products are you very familiar with? And they utilize a fake value. Um, now, it's very important that we're not asking, uh, you know, opening ourselves up to false recall. Uh, we want to make sure that we are asking them, you know, specifically brands that they regularly engage with uh, because we can then, you know, see a false value selection and say with a good degree of confidence that that user is not being honest with us. Uh, whereas if we you see questions like, have you ever 
or do you do you recall ever seeing um, any of these brands? You know, it's just you open yourself up to false recall. And finally, uh, is an open end, and this is a write-in question phrased via a very evocative question uh, to prompt a rich, insightful, or unique response, uh, which is then fed through our open end uh, text evaluator. Uh, we want to ensure that you know any copy and pasted or scripted or gibberish questions are being identified and logged. Um, you know, so you take all these together, uh, and, and this this forms what is the first impression of a user. Um, you know, it, it also determines whether or not they can get into the, you know, into the site proper or they're going to be put on any watchdog efforts or, you know, outright turned away. We try our best to uh, make sure that it's as informative as possible. But, you know, obviously there's going to be scenarios where it's just better to err on the side of caution. Rep score is what we use to assess the ongoing tenure based uh, behavior of our members for quality escalation. Um, and conversely, to see where real value lies in uh, the insights shared by the member. Rep score is, is based where we take our onboard score, uh, taking their cumulative behavior as well as obviously their open end um, to generate our first impression, figure out kind of what we're going to do with them in gestation uh, as they start doing uh, some surveys that we allow them into, uh, and then utilizing a, our algorithms to basically figure out um, their overall reputational score. Uh, we factor in, obviously, our own internal val value variable uh, against their open-end average. We look at factors such as their valid to invalid rates. Uh, we look at any potential flags that they incur. Um, and over time, we are constantly assessing a score output for them. Our next differentiator is the experiential dashboard. Hold the on there, Josh. I've got this. Oh. Hi, everybody. I'm Penelope Weiss resident data geek and part-time superhero here at Point Club. If we're talking differentiators, there's nothing cooler than Point Club's experiential dashboard. This tool allows us to capture members in the moment for all kinds of fun and informative purposes, including training, announcements, promotions and events, apologies, special offers, reward statuses, or just to say hello. Speaking from personal experiences. Well, thank you so much, Penelope. Hey, That's great. Rude. And, Pen You're so rude. No, no, ah, Penelope. I was. I was rude. Like, um, don't be mad. Oh. And in addition to these differentiators, obviously, is a host of developments that we've been pretty regularly re uh, releasing now on Point Club, including our referral friend and ambassador program, our offer walls, um, as well as some upcoming treats and. Uh, We've got some pretty big things planned for uh, 2020 and beyond. But have no fear. Point Club is here. There's no need to live in shame any longer. Point Club! Well, it looks like I have uh, pretty much blown past all my time. So um, I know we wanted to get to some questions. Um, so let's just go through and see what we have here. Uh, Karen asks, what's your advice to someone without a fun brand? Um, so by fun brand, I, you know, I assume you mean superheroes and such. Um, I think most of what I've talked about here actually still applies. Uh, you know, it's, it's transparency, you know, whether you're working with, a, um, B2B, an elite, uh, black tie panel, or, you know, you have medical professionals that are like collecting honoraria, um, transparency is still the key. So yeah. Um, so yeah, Karen, I think. I think that my advice to someone without a fun brand is to is to make the brand count. Uh, is 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 nonetheless to uh, w whatever your experience that you're offering to members or users or uh, just readers is. Make sure you know. Make sure that it is transparent and that it's sincere. Uh, you know, optics is huge. Uh, if you're selling things, if you're selling an experience, if you're selling products. Uh, you know, I try not to insult anyone's intelligence. You can call transactional transactional and that's okay. Um, you know, just, just try not try to avoid, avoid hyperbole and try to avoid, uh, insulting their intelligence at the same time. Um, all right. So, uh, one more Jeff asks, why did panels get such a bad rep? Uh, I, um, <laughs> Jeff, I'm not going to read their name. Um, why did panels get such a bad rep? Um, you know, and Jeff, I think I think the the question is why do panels get such a bad rep? 
um, you know, speaking from experience back in the, you know, the early mid aughts, um, you know, there were, there were panel sites everywhere, uh, and, and panel sites that were promised for every vertical under the sun. You know, they were, they, they, they went after everything from IT professionals to moms, to dads, to babies, to, uh, pets, uh, you had, you had, you know, hundreds of these uh, panel websites that were, you know, they, 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 they promised verticals, but once you got inside, you realized it was the same inventory with the same users uh, uh, from experience to experience. It was, it was very template driven. And then obviously you, you had a lot of shadiness in the space. And uh, a lot of these sites were built on the cheap. Um, you know, they, they had a, again, we talked about Coats of paint. <laughs> well, this was the perfect example of, of a very surface level engagement where it was branded as, you know, IT professional surveys. And then you go in and it's the same toothpaste studies anyone else is taken, uh, taking. Um, you know, so, so that was really cloying. I think that left a bad taste in people's mouths. And then obviously, you know, you just have shadier and shadier practices going on in the panel space to where uh, the value prop is lost for, for respondents. Uh, what's the point of joining any of these, um, you know, and, and the costs, uh, skyrocket, you know, for, for, uh, the companies. And then, and then you, you think about, you know, with API and, and other sources, uh, you know, there's, there's things that are seen as quicker, cheaper ways to, uh, get projects done from an MR perspective. And, and, and that's great, but, you know, uh, with with the state of quality, <laughs> a lot of the other things we touched on, um, you know, the the benefits of of having a panel, um, having a panel that you can cultivate and grow is is ultimately that you uh, you're you're in full control from a management perspective of the destiny of the data, um, you know, API and those things. I I, I get the appeal. And I definitely understand it, especially uh, downshifting from, you know, the the the, the reskinned websites uh, we spoke about. But I think that when you're able to make sure that you have a strong user experience, as we've talked about here for a while now, um, I think that that's that's what makes the difference, and, and that's when, when uh, panels in 2019 can sing uh, and resonate. So I, I hope that answers your question, Jeff. Uh, again, I, I left out the shade you tossed in there, but um, I think, well, anyway. Uh, yeah, I hope I answered your question, Jeff. Thank you. All right, well, I, I know there's a couple other questions, but we are running really low on time. So um, I'm going to, to email responses to everyone else who's asked a question in the chat. Um, and I want to thank everyone for uh, attending today. Um, if anything, the goal here was really to get a dialogue going, and and I hope I, I hope we've achieved that. I hope that this has brought some interesting points to light for you, or was uh, entertaining at the very least. Um, so, on behalf of Innovate, my name is Josh Bresner. Uh, thank you again for attending, and I hope you have a great day. Bye.